I'd like to start by thanking Sheep Genetics for the opportunity to, um, to come over here. It's great to be in, in Melbourne. Um, it's certainly nicer here than it is in Dunedin um, in summertime. I'll start by giving you a little bit of background to Abacus Bio for those of you who, who don't know the organisation. Um, we pride ourselves on working from farm to plate. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Um, we pride ourselves on working from, from farm to plate, um, and although it may sound a bit um, byliney, we try and make a difference to agriculture um, using the best science and technology that we can. Uh, we have about 30 people, um, and we have some PhD students that work with us in, in conjunction with universities. Um, one of our students currently works, um, he's actually doing his PhD through UNE, so there's um, some good connections there with Australia. We have a strength in genetic improvement programs um, where we work with uh, people involved in services for producing milk, meat, fibre, um, fish and a little bit out there is honeybees. Uh, we work with ram and bull breeders um, all over the place and um, in particular, I work with um, sheep breeders in, in New Zealand, um, so closely with the people like the likes of yourselves to try and increase profitability. Um, and we also work with commercial farmers, meat companies, and other technology providers in industry. So with the idea in mind that this session is about um, business development to increase genetic gain, I'm going to give you um, a little bit of insight into a case study that we did um, to show the value of genetics to your clients. So I, the way I see this is that um, this should give you some insight into the tools that are available to you to show your clients the type of value you're generating for them. Um, and while that might not mean genetic gain per se for you, it should enable you to um, sell your genetics better and therefore um, generate more revenue and hopefully invest that into increasing genetic gain. So this is Garth Shaw. He uh, has a performance recorded flock in South Otago, so it's um, about an hour south of Dunedin. Grows heaps of grass, some are safe, uh, a little bit cold in winter. Um, really strong on genetic merit for growth in meat. Um, I'll give you some details on that in a little while. Um, and he wanted to be able to show how what he is doing adds value to, to commercial farmers. Um, so he asked us to give him a hand with that, and we uh, went through a process of using genetic trends um, for his flock compared to the industry to describe the type of value that he's able to pass on to his, um, his clients. So I'll show you some trends in a minute, but we focused on growth in meat and we looked at trends in his 2015 born rams and we said what if we upgraded a commercial flock that was running at the industry average with rams from, from Whare Toa. Um, and we used a program called FarmMax which is like a bioeconomic modelling tool which allows you to um, put information in and describe a farming system basically. So we used genetic trends to inform a farming system and use the differences in genetic trends to show value. I've got a few of these, these graphs and um, I don't have to explain to, to, to you guys as a crowd what, what genetic trends mean. Um, so this is for weaning weight which is, is I guess more, more or less equivalent to your um, post weaning weight here in, in Australia. Uh, this is the industry average, this blue line and this is the progress that um, for, for Garth's maternal flock, um, and this is the difference um, that he is achieving above the industry in his 2015 lamb crop. So we've got um, more or less half a kilo of weaning weight. Uh, same sort of graph, but for uh, ewe effect on weaning weight, another half a kilo. Uh, carcass weight, 
over half a kilo um, and lean meat yield um, again uh, over half a kilo. So significant differences in the performance of his flock for growth in meat uh, relative to industry. Um, I've converted all of those um, traits into what they would represent in terms of weight of lamb and when you put them together you're looking at about three kilos of extra um, weight of lamb and garth sheep and the, the progeny of garth rams compared to compared to industry and we we have that obviously because the rams only pass on half um, and then one thing that I've done is added the impact of bigger ewes so this growth rate will be producing bigger ewes um, and we're looking at uh, we're looking at three kilograms more live weight of of lamb as a result of these genetics. If we then so that sorry maybe I didn't explain that's for his maternal size. So we took maternal genetic trends. He's got maternal and terminal sheep provides um, both to clients. So he's well positioned there. If we do the same thing but for the terminal genetics. Um, we have the same sort of traits. We've got weaning weight, about 400 grams of growth. We've got carcass weight, another 300 grams of difference. Um, and we've got lean meat yield, uh, again, a couple of hundred grams there above, above industry average. When we combine these in the same way I did for the maternals, we've got, um, we've got uh, about 1.7 kilos of live weight in in the terminal side progeny of Garth's sheep compared to industry average. Again, putting that into um, the commercial flock, it's um, half that, and then um, the assumption is that there's a, a hybrid vigor effect by using the terminals over his maternals, and that actually results in a realization of, of genetic gain, um, of, 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 gen, um, of genetic performance as well. So the the genetic trend impact or the differences in genetics between Garth's flock and industry average equates to about three kilograms of live weight through growth in meat from using his maternal size, about, three, about the same for using the terminal size and a little bit of hybrid vigour in there. And then um, as a result of having heavier maternal ewes, we've got um, lambing percentage, so that's essentially a, a, a ewe size effect. And we've also got a hybrid vigour effect of using um, the terminal rams over the maternal ewes to, to increase lamb survival. And so with a bit of information from the genetic trend with your, which you're all familiar with, we've converted that into some sort of commercial farm impact and they said, all right, what if we took a commercial flock which is performing based on the industry average and then added in in one foul swoop, which is probably not realistic but um, because you'd have to put the rams in over time and they would flow in but if we did it in one foul swoop and said what if we replaced the rams in that average flock with with the Garth Shaw's rams with these sort of differences um, what sort of revenue would that generate for that commercial farmer on an annual basis. So a little bit of detail about Farmax. I'm not sure if there's the same sort of tools here in Australia. Uh, Farmax is a bioeconomic um, farm modelling tool it works with feed supply based on information on pasture growth rates. Um, animal systems, you um, include performance on weight of um, adult sheep and lambs, on growth rate, on reproductive rate, um, and the mix of livestock species, so you might have um, some cattle and stuff in there. And it creates what's called a sort of a biological fit, um, predicts feed requirements and feed demands. And it's a really powerful tool for um, investigating options for farm systems changes or the impact of doing something different because you can create the farm system change on the desktop, have a look at the impact and then make a decision about whether you want to go down that path. Um, and so it creates outputs and cents per kilogram of dry matter which you can convert into some um, bottom line impact on the farm. And we used it as an alternative to something like a selection index model or a bioeconomic model for breeding objectives, we used it to actually say um, if we put in genetics with this higher growth and survival performance, what does it actually mean um, from prof in profit terms? So this, um, I don't know how this compares to a, a type, what you'd consider a base farm here in Australia, I suspect it's pretty different. 
Um, this is what a base South Otago farm looks like, not too far from Garth. Uh, 300 hectares of cultivatable land, so it's pretty rolling stuff. Um, 50 hectares of steep grazing land, some cropping is done, and some baleage in summer because there's excess feed. Uh, carries about 3,000 ewes, there's 70 kilos when mated, uh, weaned in December and weaning about 140%, so reasonably high reproductive rate um, in these terminal, sorry, in, the, in this um, base um, meat, meat and wool producing farm. Unmated hoggets, um, uh, by Australian standards, a pretty low carcass weight there. Um, that's where we operate, it's probably a bit lean as well based on yesterday's comments. Um, and in this base model, all of the ewes are mated to, to maternal size. What we then did was we said, okay, what happens if we replaced um, that base flock with 10% with of the ewes being mated to terminal size from garth flock, um, or 40% of terminal size from garth flock. So that's saying, let's put the impact of those terminal side performance above the average into the flock and see what revenue it generates. We then said, what if we switched the genetics of that base flock across to um, Garth's maternal and then added in the, the extra genetic merit of those terminal size? And we did the same as, uh, as this one here, but we said, what if we increase carcass weight? So there's a few kind of scenarios there where we said, let's put this genetics in and see what revenue it generates. Uh, the assumptions were that the feed, ply, feed supply was the same across, across the um, production system, so you can structure that in FarmMax to say that the grass grown is the same, and, and um, so how does this genetics then utilise that same amount of grass? Um, we had to lift the U. I mentioned earlier on that there was a genetic trend impact of, um, of sorry, there were, there were bigger lambs because of bigger ewes, and so we've put the bigger ewes in. We've lifted the lambing percentage by um, the 8% as a result of those big ewes, which takes it from the 141 in the last slide up to the 149 here. And we've lifted the live weight by three kilos, which is that maternal effect um, of gas, gas sheep over the industry average. And then we've done the, we've been, in, uh, implemented the genetic impact of terminals through the extra carcass weight and terminal sire effect. So, and you, you can put this in the context of, of, the, of what you would see your genetics doing in a commercial farm, and I've got no doubt that you will understand that. Um, basically, from a production system point of view for meat, what happened was when you put in this faster growth rate, and it makes pretty clear sense, the kill date was, was moved earlier. Um, and what that meant was that the lamb sold earlier freed up freed up feed, which represents an opportunity. And we structured a couple of ways in which that extra feed could be used. We kept the carcass weight at 18 kilos, but increased the size of the ewe flock, so there's a bit more carrying capacity there. Or we um, brought in some feed. Well, on top of increasing ewe flock, we brought in some lambs to utilise that extra feed. The other way was to, as I mentioned, to increase that um, carcass weight to 22 kilos, and then if there was space, increase ewe numbers, but not bring in any lamps from outside. When we looked across the, and I'll show you a table of this in a minute, when we looked across the board about what was generating the revenue from the extra genetics, it was a bunch of different things, and it'll be the same in your production systems, or your clients' production systems, is that it'll come from a combination of all the things in your breeding objective, and it's about working out what that's worth to the commercial farmer. So it came from an increase in lambing percentage, which was due in part to hybrid vigour and part to bigger ewes. It came from the heavier weaning weights that I mentioned. Uh, lambs either sold earlier at a higher value because of seasonal price drift or um, sold um, heavier in the, in the scenario where we were able to finish those lambs to heavier weights. Um, there, is a, there is a copy of the final report here, which, which I can... I can um, make available to, to you guys in this room if there's any interest in that. So if we, if we take a closer look at the, the details of what generated the revenue or the, the farm system outcomes of that better genetics, 
Um, when we took the base flock and added 40% terminal size, we were able to generate about another $27,000 on the bottom line as a result of that performance. And that was either through finishing those lambs earlier um, and using the extra feed generated to increase the ewe flock or buy in lambs and, and finish them. Um, really interesting um, point is, is about the increased growth rate, which when, you, when you're selling lambs at a, fixed, at a fixed carcass weight target, increased growth rate converts directly into just more lambs gone at a particular time of the year. And that's, um, that is a really, really good way of generating um, grass, which you can use for other things. Average kill date, as I mentioned, moved earlier by about a week when, um, when the terminal size were put in there with that extra genetic merit and we were able to increase use U flock a little bit and finish, in this case, finish a whole lot of extra lambs, which is which is more opportunity to generate profit. When we added in the um, maternal to the mix, we then saw a really significant jump in um, the profitability of the, the farm business. And so, um, uh, not too dissimilar from the terminal 40% terminal size scenario when we put in that elite maternal genetics for growth in meat, more lambs were gone. Um, average slaughter date shifted significantly earlier and um, we increased the ewe flock slightly but we didn't finish those extra lambs because the idea being that um, that was not the target for that scenario. And then finally um, a little bit more revenue was generated by carrying um, the lambs to a heavier carcass weight, so you'll see the um, average slaughter date shifts back out because you're putting more weight on the lambs, but then you've obviously got a higher price per, um, per head, and so that generates more profit. So this is just one example in a case study of the kind of impact that quality growth in meat genetics can have on, on a commercial farm business. Um, there's a few caveats to it in that we obviously, we obviously modelled it as though the commercial farm had created a wholesale change in their flock and shifted to the new genetics in, in one go, which is obviously not possible, but the idea was to portray the kind of value that's available if you're using the right genetics. So it's not hard to do these type of analyses um, to show the value of your genetics to your clients, and I think it's a fantastic selling tool. Um, people like to see the value of what you're offering in their terms and if you can do that um, I think it's pretty powerful for your business. Um, this is about growth in meat um, and a, a, a number of you will be, will be wool growers and I can't see any reason why there, there wouldn't be the same sort of profit um, principles which you can apply to growth and reproduction in your businesses and show that to your clients. Um, you can use this to support um, the value generated from your breeding program and, and A, justify the prices you ask for your rams and B, generate some more revenue to, to actually drive your genetic gain faster. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions um, about the analysis or, or talk to you more about it afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Oh, Tim, a couple of things. Uh, the heavier maternal ewes, any allowance in that those ewes will eat more feed? So that, that's built into the model? Yeah, that's in there as well. So the farm max model accounts for the fact that if you have bigger animals, they require more maintenance feed. But it turns out that the, the cost of that is obviously, given the profit, is offset by, um, by the extra revenue from that better genetics. And actually, even, and I was talking to Swanee about this before, um, most economic models around the place show that the value of growth is still more than the cost of um, bigger ewes. So most sheep industries around the world are still lifting ewe weight up because there's more money in growth than there is cost in keeping slightly bigger ewes. That story, sorry, that story may change when, when the ewes are too big to drag across the board and shear, but we're not quite there yet, maybe. And, and the other assumption I wanted to ask about was the one with uh, reproduction rate going up 8% with yeah. bigger ewes. That, I, I'd imagine that would hold within flock 
but I'm not convinced you could go across flock and make that assumption. Yeah, so the, the, the research suggests that it, the scanning percent goes up by about 2% per kilogram of live weight, thereabouts. Um, and that's out of New Zealand. I'm not sure whether it holds here in, in Marinos. I think it does. Um, so that's across flock knowing. rather than just within flock. That's yeah. That, that's that's a, a, a that's a size effect. I think it should hold um, across flock. So it's not a it's not a genetic effect per se. It's a um, biological effect of being a bigger animal, basically. Yeah, that's all I was thinking. With uh, different flocks that have had different emphasis on reproduction rate, yeah, I, I would go to say there's some small users around that have got reproduction rates. Agreed. And, agreed. and within that flock, maybe the you know, two percent holds per kilo or whatever it was, but across flock, it might be a long bow to draw. Uh, it could be, yeah, I agree. Um, I think that we we shouldn't rely on bigger ewes to produce extra reproductive rate because, as you said, there's plenty of sheep out there that aren't that big and can still put out a couple of lambs or whatever. So we should focus on finding them using um, the tools we've got, which is, as you know. Um, as Tom mentioned, things like getting your NLW sorted and getting your, your um, birth rank and rearing rank so that you actually know the reproductive performance from a genetics point of view rather than relying on size. Thanks, Tim. Um, just a question around, I guess, climate variability and, and what that genetic gain does in terms of a failed season. Uh, did you do any sort of risk analysis around if that pasture growth curve was 20% was lower in a year? What? Um, so, so my assumption is that the better genetics also get off farm quicker and you can handle a poor event um, better? Yeah, so we, uh, the answer to that question is no, we didn't do it. Um, we, the, the production system is quite summer safe and whatnot, so we kind of focused on that. I would say that if it was a situation where it was going to be dry or the season was a fail, then you're probably positioned better having the better genetics because it gives you more options. You've got lambs that are growing faster, you can bail out earlier if you need to and they'll be further down the path. Um, it's better to have genetics capable of doing something um, and giving yourself decisions than actually being in trouble and not being able to make any decisions because you don't have the genetics to deliver. Um, I have a question for you, Tim. I'm just wondering, in New Zealand, um, how or how regular do you have um, individual breeders come to you wanting to ha um, do economic modelling on what they've been doing in terms of placing a value on their genetic progress? Um, I wouldn't say they're knocking the door down. Um, I've got a number of breeders, um, and it tends to be the advanced breeders that want to have a a little bit more of an understanding about the impact of their genetics in commercial flocks. Um, I've probably done a, a few analyses like this for maybe half a dozen breeders um, on an annual basis. I um, also work closely with breeders to do things like selection indexes, customised selection indexes and things like that which really get at what the breeder thinks is important for his, client, his or her clients and we can use that to help drive selection.